All right, good afternoon, everyone. I uh, want to welcome you to our special uh, meeting of the Commission on Police Practices for Thursday, January, uh, I don't know if I said 22nd, on the 20th. Um, the purpose of this meeting is we are trying to do a special meeting so we can have uh, the Commission provide some feedback. We're going to draft a memo, and we'll be saying that to the City Council. Uh, about the proposed draft uh, implementation ordinance. So before this meeting, um, Patrick did a group on last Thursday when we were having our closed session. He did uh, the round table with Standing for Justice, collaborated with them, got some of their initial feedback. Earlier this morning at our ad hoc transition committee meeting, which Doug is chairing, we presented uh, that feedback. We had a discussion about it. We tried to put those in priority order. And then what we went to do is bring that forward uh, to our commission. And then we can kind of debate that discuss that, ask any questions. And then the idea is we want to be able to forward a, a memo to everyone um, on the city council to kind of let them know what at least the commission feels the priority, sh priority should be. And then we also uh, wanted to see who on the commission uh, wants to attend the meeting tomorrow. And then I think we'll, we'll each have about one minute, uh, depending if, on how many people they have for public comment. We'll have about a minute for public comment. So if we have you know three or four of us that want to go there, we can figure out which points we want to try to raise during that minute of public comment. So just want to give a quick summary of what the purpose and the objective of today's uh, special session is, um, which I kind of, that kind of goes into the purpose of the Commission on Police Practices. Um, but with that, we can go to roll call with Charmaine. Chair Holpert. I am here. Commissioner Case. Here. Commissioner Fitch. Here. Commissioner Holtrop. Here. Commissioner Anderson? Here. Commissioner Workman? I don't think I see him. I don't see him. Excused. Commissioner Dent? Here. Commissioner Harrington? Here. Commissioner Smith? Did she log in? I don't believe so. Commissioner Clark? Here. Commissioner Shea is excused. Commissioner Vaughn? Present. Commissioner Dabba Griffin? I don't see her. Commissioner Spruce? Here. Commissioner Pink is excused. That completes roll call. All right, and then um, because this is a special um, session meeting, public comment is a little bit different. We don't have non-agenda public comment, but if there are any uh, people that choose to join in right now, I don't see any attendees on this, um, they can uh, raise their hand and we can go to them and, and have them do their public comment about the questions. But with that, I will share the screen and I can go over to the draft recommendations. Give me just one second. All right, so, and then Doug, if you want to um, kind of chime in since, you know, officially this is kind of what I think you had helped put together. But um, as I said a little bit earlier, earlier this morning, we had a uh, special transition committee meeting where we um, looked at all the feedback that we got from what Patrick had pulled together with Standings for Justice. And then the transition committee reviewed that and we voted unanimously um, to move these forward to the commission for, for feedback and review. Uh, Doug, do you want to go over this or do you want me to just kind of read through all these? Um, I can go through it. I don't, I'm not sure I need to read each one word for word. Uh, the first one is actually a repeat of uh, the recommendation that we made in our November letter, uh, which was ignored. <laughs> not the letter was ignored, but this uh, <clears throat> item was not included in the revised draft. <clears throat> uh, it, it relates to um the issue that currently in the in the current draft all 25 seats are designated seats uh, two designated as youth seats and the other um 21 i'm sorry 23 uh, designated uh by a geographical district uh, either a, a city council district or a um, um moderate to low income census tract um we discussed in the past the difficulties of uh, having that rigid of a, uh, a system. It's very difficult to fill vacancies as it is. Uh, and it's also very limiting if you have somebody who has a particular experience um, or expertise uh, 
to appoint them to the commission and have, unless they happen to reside in a seat where they're in an area where there currently is a vacancy. And it's also difficult to uh, create a diversity on the uh, on the commission, uh, if you don't have the flexibility of considering people from various areas. And so we recommended that uh, 14 and non-designated seats, uh, the 14 of the, the 14 of the 25 seats be non-designated and uh, we're repeating that. Uh, we also spent quite a bit of time talking about uh, <coughs> what the uh, criteria should be for filling the seats in particular, the uh, non-designated seats So we looked at um, uh, other uh, oversight agencies. We looked at some research and uh, we spent quite a bit of time coming up with this language. And so we want to continue to uh, uh, no, we want to continue to um, bring this forward. And uh, it was the sense this was our most important uh, ask of the uh, of the committee. Um, the second one is uh, in the uh, second draft of the ordinance, uh, we had requested uh, that uh, the commission explicitly be given the authority to make nominations, and that was included. Um, but there also was included that the commission may prepare an operating procedure for its nominating process. So we outlined in our previous memo what we envisioned that process to be. Um, and um, in our discussion this morning, we thought that it would be <clears throat> uh, really that, that that process of nomination from the commission is important enough that it should be required, not just that may develop a procedure, um, and that we should specify that that procedure includes the opportunity for a community input and interviewing and selection of the nominees. Um, and There was quite a bit of, okay, going on to number three, there was quite a bit of discussion uh, at the, the transition committee meeting last week at the uh, San Diegans for Justice uh, forum on Tuesday. And again, at our meeting this morning regarding uh, criminal convictions, uh, the, I think the primary concern is that the uh, current version of the ordinance would preclude anybody with a felony a conviction, no matter how long ago it was, and no matter what the nature of the felony, would automatically be excluded from the commission. And uh, the initial recommendation that we discussed this morning was to change that, uh, but there also was a feeling uh, expressed that there are some um, of the uh, misdemeanor uh, convictions that uh, were listed as a exclusionary that didn't necessarily have to be. So for example, if somebody had a domestic violence uh, uh, conviction, uh, many years ago and was rehabilitated uh, that may not necessarily you know need to exclude them from serving on on the commission for life um, <clears throat> number four uh, is the uh, definition of investigations uh, we had asked them to consider the san diegans for justice definition um, they did rewrite the definition but they kind of left out the heart of the san diegans for justice definition and that was the comprehensive gathering of information from <clears throat> original sources with the keyword being original sources. And <clears throat> there's a sense that if the, if you rely on the current definition, you could make an argument uh, that if you uh, simply gather information from uh, secondary sources, such as a IA or homicide uh, investigation, that that would uh, be sufficient to qualify as an investigation. So we wanted to have that <clears throat> clarified and enhanced. Okay, uh, Brandon, do you want to go through questions as we go through each one, or do you want to go back? Um, I was thinking what might make the most sense is we can kind of go over all of these first, and then we can go through each of the commissioners to uh, let us know which ones they want to ask questions about or want to, to go into further details on, and then we can kind of okay. formalize that. Okay, because I saw a comment that somebody wanted to add a question. Okay. Uh, number five is the, um, we had uh, re 
requested uh, that the uh, uh, ordinance that well, the part of the ordinance that requires uh, the, the police department uh, to uh, provide records to the commission should be expanded to all city departments. It should not be limited necessarily to the police department. And um, we also wanted to, uh, you know, clear, we asked for a definition of records, which they decided they didn't, for whatever reason, want to come up with the definition of records. But we also, in our previous recommendation, which we repeated here, was we wanted the records we received to be unredacted unless it was re redaction was required by law. Um, and then uh, we also would like for the records, which is one of the reasons why we wanted a definition, to include uh, data and not just a, a record that is in a report uh, or a document of some sort. Um, and um, and we also wanted to specifically mentioned that disciplinary records of police officers uh, were available to the commission and less prohibited by by law. And so those were things in the previous uh, request which uh, were not included. Um, six, there was a phrase that are considered personal records uh, in a section of the in the section of the document that actually refers to records and uh, we thought that was uh, limiting um, and unnecessary. Um, and so we asked that that uh, be deleted. Um, number seven was that, uh, and again, this is a repeat from uh, the 17 requests that we made in uh, in November that the commission investigators should have full access to crime scenes on first walkthroughs. Um, we did get a uh, informal opinion uh, via email from our outside counsel that uh, investigation procedures um, approved by the city council would be compelling upon the police department and that this, this could be included in the investigation procedures, but there was a sense that this was uh, important enough uh, that it ought to be include, included in the uh, implementation ordinance since in the hierarchy of uh, ordinances or documents that would be, uh, be higher. Um, number eight was, uh, we, we expressed concern about uh, the references uh, to collective bargaining. Um, <clears throat> and whether or not that could open up um, a situation where the PD or the POA could, uh, you know, through the back door influence the commission practices and, and procedures. Um, and then number nine, which was something that was uh, added uh, by San Diegans for Justice, which we agreed with, which was the ordinance should require uh, that all complaints, findings, decisions, and recommendations by the commission be made public to the fullest extent of the law. Um, maybe we should change that. I intended to change it that maybe pu maybe public to the fullest extent allowed by the law uh, or, or permitted by the law as soon as practical. Um, and to add that to the uh, sec the new section of the ordinance, which deals with transparency and uh, reporting to the community issues. Um, <clears throat> no, keeping in mind, as we know, that, that many things currently are not publicly available because of POBAR, uh, but this states that uh, what is available uh, should be made available uh, in a timely way. And then I put a note at the end that one of uh, the things that uh, we included in our 17 recommendations uh, in in November to PSNLN is that we thought that the um, selection of the executive director that the uh, commission leadership should be involved in that even though the appointment authority resides with the city council um, and and there's still a strong feeling that we should you know pursue that uh, but we were advised um, by Henry Foster from uh, the chief of staff in district four, that the most appropriate place to do that was not in the implementation ordinance, but in the new ordinance that they just implemented a couple of months ago to create the office of the commission on police practices, because that's the uh, place in the municipal code where they talk about uh, the appointment and the duties of the executive director. And so I 
put that there just so that the council members know that uh, that's still an issue for us and uh, that we will be pursuing that, uh, but not through the implementation ordinance. And so those were our recommendations. Um, we kind of talked as we went through our meeting this morning of which ones are most important. We didn't <clears throat> necessarily rank them one through nine. Uh, I just kind of ranked them uh, based upon which ones seemed to be the most important based on our discussion. Uh, and I'm not sure that the specific rankings are as important as giving them a sense of what our most important uh, concerns are. And so I'll leave it at that and respond to questions. Yeah, and with that, um, I just kind of want to open up to all the commissioners, commissioners to ask any questions. I know, Kevin, you had some, um, you know, if we want to go into any details on that. And I also do have with our agenda, I have the actual ordinance up so we can go back and forth if we need to. Um, so, Kevin, I, I see that you have questions first. Go ahead. Uh, so could you scroll up, please? <clears throat> Which number did you want? Yeah, that, that, that's, that's good. I can read them all from there. So... Uh, I'm curious about a few things. <clears throat> the individuals residing in police beats with higher numbers of complaints of excessive use of force, complaints of discrimination, warrantless stops and searches, individuals or family members who have prior adverse reactions. So all this is just based, I mean... <laughs> You're saying that these seats would be, because anybody can apply, right? So I'm wondering why there's all these definitions of certain types of people who have had experiences. I'm just curious about why this is listed, like why it reads this way when anybody can apply from anywhere. Are you saying because we want to make sure that we would hold a seat from someone in the public who wants one for someone who's saying they were no, 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 had they, a these bad are experience? No, these are not designated seats. These are just uh, some a list of uh, criteria uh, that uh, could be used to decide uh, who to appoint on on the commission. So any, anybody can apply, uh, but there's looking for people with certain types of experiences and expertise. Um, Doug, if I could provide a little background here, I think Kevin's asking for where this came from. So this, this is a list of different things that came not only from the community, but also from city council and from NACOL. Um, and none of these are requirements of any of the seats. They're just um, priorities for the commission to keep in mind in, in terms of, they, we're supposed to be thinking about diversity in different ways than we're sort of conventionally thinking about it or in addition to those ways. And so, for example, it is considered good practice to invite and encourage applications from people who have experience with mental health, who are actual professionals, um, or like one of our commissioners now, our prof uh, professionals um, in different kinds of social work and so on. But those are very broad categories. The language that we use here, I mean, we went through, we did so much research on what the data actually show, what they don't show, what people think they show, and so on. We ended up with this language, which we pulled from different boards and commissions all over California, including like the RIPA board, the new certification board. I think it was the city of Davis oversight panel and so on. And the intention here is definitely not to designate seats, but to indicate to the nominating committee, look, we want to encourage applications from people who actually have an experience you know, or uh, family members of someone who's had an adverse interaction. Um, and we want to make it clear um, to the public that we welcome applications like that. So this is the language that actually comes from lots of different existing boards um, that we shaped over months with um, in consultation with city council and with NACOL. Um, and this, this is actually one that the CPP endorsed. I can't remember. This has been such a long process. I can't remember the exact thing, but does that help explain? I understand what you're yeah. saying. Yeah, that does. 
and and it, it does read should be given not that it shall which i like just because it should be open to everybody but yeah, i also yeah. do like that this is indicative for people like if i was someone in the public who felt like i had a bunch of bad experiences this welcomes me to to feel like oh i i can join this thing it's okay for me to be there yeah. and i should be there so that's not a bad thing i just yeah. was curious um the other question i have is uh shall prepare an operating budget for its uh, okay so the commission shall prepare an operating procedure for its nomination process that includes community input in the interviewing and selection of nominees right <clears throat> so who who decides who the community is and who decides how many of community members get to have input or how does that work so i can also answer this one um so what the community original the community when I'm using the word the community, I'm talking about all the people who've shown up during this process. And I realize that's a small, there's a much broader community. But they wanted from the very beginning to have in the implementation ordinance an actual committee of community members who would be involved in the appointment and so on. And city council um, and our legal uh, analyst and the city attorney all of them came back and said, look, the city charter is clear. Appointment, the only authority to appoint lies with the city council. There can be nobody sure. else at this level. So the compromise that we worked out was to say in the implementation ordinance, we should make it clear that once the new commission is set up, um, they should, so what this does is it says, once you're set up, you have to sort this out and figure out essentially what our, um, uh, I forget what it's called. Uh, is it Ernestine or Kevin? It may be you, the person who goes out to find people to interview. This basically mandates that some process gets set up by the future commission, and they're going to have to work out how to involve interested community, community members in that stage. So we're not getting involved with the setting up of all of that. We're just indicating in the we want them to indicate in the ordinance that the commission does need to do that work down the road does that make sense yeah it does it just doesn't it and of course anytime the community is involved it's supposed to represent the community the constitution's for the community it's for the people not the government so i like it but i also just worry that uh you know who who, who at that point would decide you know which community members get input or or which outweighs the other and who might be excluded because a bunch of those people over there don't like th these people over here S you know so someone else might not get on the commission that wants to be on the commission based on other people's opinions versus the committee just saying i'm going to evaluate a community member based on their ability to do the job and then give them the job you know what i mean yeah so, and thankfully we don't because, we don't have to solve that right now we're just directing the future commission to deal to deal with how it to make sure that it sets up a process for nominating people that's the thing the city council has to be the body that appoints and we want we want to make sure that even though that's true, this, the commission plays an act, is mandated to play an active role um, in getting nominations to the, the city council. Well, and Kevin, we did uh, include in our previous letter a suggestion uh, for new bylaws, uh, although we, we had proposed it for bylaws and the ordinance is recommending that it be in an operating procedure, which would be approved by the city council. But the example we gave them or the proposal we gave them uh, was to have uh, nine people on the panel, uh, three of them being uh, current or former commission members and the other six being representatives of community organizations. And we talked about you know, what kind of organizations uh, might be included there and we might uh, rotate the organizations you know, during the years, okay. et cetera. That was kind of what we were, what we were thinking. Um, I see. So, and then number three, it says past criminal convictions should not automatically, you know, disqualify an applicant. Um, I know that's, it's just very open-ended, right? So like, there are certain things that, 
that you 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 could never get access to a public office position if you've had a felony or a misdemeanor of domestic violence like those things are 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 some of those are absolutes and this is just kind of open so i guess i'm trying to figure out so i can explain and, and the also, background here so well, this is also it's the the other well, hold on the other thing is this doesn't also clarify the fact that have we even found out or asked what's PD going to do? Because they might say, well, you put this person on the, the commission because you wanted to, and the, they got appointed, but this person didn't clear our own back. They're still going to do a background check to some No, extent, they are not. Right? I know pers no, so personnel is the only one that's going to do it. Exactly. But, okay. but Kevin, Kevin, I think just if I, seriously, if you let me explain the background, you'll understand why this is here. So the current draft of the implementation ordinance doesn't sort of lay out those fine distinctions. It simply says that if you have a felony or misdemeanor um, anywhere, anywhere in the past, you, essentially you're banned from being on this commission. So what this is doing is saying, I mean, there are all kinds of felonies. There are all kinds of misdemeanors. Some of those laws don't even exist as felonies and misdemeanors anymore. Some people have had them overturned and so on. But the current language said if you had ever had a felony or a misdemeanor, you could not serve on this commission. And so this was just about saying an automatic ban for any felony or misdemeanor is inappropriate for this commission. And so we're just, we're not saying those things can't be used. We're saying that a previous conviction should just, it shouldn't automatically disqualify someone. Do you see what I mean? No, I do. But I'm just saying there are certain ones that are permanent, but I guess you're saying it's just any value. Okay, so. It's because of the so, language of the, of the draft. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't, you guys don't foresee in the future like personnel, I know that's what Mon Monica Montgomery's chief of staff said, um, that it will be personnel that does it, right? Um, you don't foresee them uh, in the at some point, or are they just literally going to be barred or banned from not being able to run a background, or it like that that portion of this process been removed from them and given to only to personnel, and that will, you know, satisfy that part of it so i guess what i'm saying is i'm 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 thinking at some point someone might be curious in within internal affairs to 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 want to know of course they'll see personnel's you know evaluation um but they have a duty and a responsibility to, to, to certain confidential you know information that they have to protect and how will that conflict with personnel only doing it D does that make sense it does, but the, we're not, that's not actually up for us to consider with this. It's because the, the background checks are designated as being done by, this is what um, indicates the independence, a part of the independence of the commission, that it's personnel doing the background checks. I don't think we, I, I mean, I think you're right. There are going to be times in the future where there's a complication or somebody raises an objection and those conflicts are going to come up. But we're not actually, mm -hmm. we're not facing those in this implementation ordinance. And this mm -hmm. particular item is not about um, solving that potential problem. It's simply about removing an overreach in the draft ordinance, which said that any, you know, a felony or, or misdemeanor in the past disqualifies you, you can't be considered. And that, that's a way too broad of an exclusion. So that's what, all that this well, is trying to clear up here. No, and just to clarify, Patrick, it did not say all misdemeanors. It, would, it listed certain misdemeanors. Sorry, it, certain, you're right. Yeah. It wasn't. Yeah. Well, well, also, so this just says past criminal convictions. It doesn't specify misdemeanor or felonies. And, and I, I feel like that's going to come up right away, which is, well, felonies are an exclusion because they are an exclusion. You can't, you know ever own a gun again, you can't vote if you have a felon, you know, there's all these other exclusions. So why I feel like that's gonna apply here, regardless of what this says. Does that make sense? Um, I'm well, just trying to- we, we removed the felony exclusion um, right after the passage of measure B from all of the CPP's um, documents. And that was, 
that was because, again, not only did the community want that out, the, the, the community members who were engaged with the process want that out, but it's also considered by NACOL um, to be advisable for this kind of board. Again, I think you're right. There are going to be all kinds of complications and objections raised, um, but I, I am adamantly opposed to a criminal conviction necessarily um, uh, disqualifying someone. Um, I think, yeah. I think as the appointment process continues, then city council can dig in and the selection committee can dig in and figure out what exactly something is. But a blank check disqualification to me mm -hmm. is completely inappropriate for, uh, for this commission. And also no, I can agree with that. I, I just was curious about the other workings of it, like how it might function, but if that's going to be for later, then that's going to be for later. So, and I'm just going to add, wow. there's, there's a little bit of a difference too, because it, it, back in the day when it was still CRB and we used to meet at internal affairs, um, I think the department's perspective was we have the right to decide who has access to our facilities going forward. That's not going to be an issue because obviously we're going to have our own offices. We're going to have our own meeting space. Um, you know, we're reviewing all of our cases remotely now, but we didn't want it to become an issue where the police department could effectively bar a commissioner, you know, the time a board member from doing their job by deciding we're not going to let you into our building, um, which you know, effectively made them no longer an effective board member or commissioner. So that's not going to happen going forward just because we are going to be separated from them. But um, I, I pulled up the, the ordinance that actually talks about that specific issue. So you can actually see the, the individual components they had in there for the felony, misdemeanor, et cetera. Right. So it takes place during the final stage of the appointment process. Uh, criminal convictions or other involvement with law enforcement arrest detentions do not bar a member except as described in a subsection. I don't know if it's classified about considerations or criminal history includes regardless of the date, a felony or felony or misdemeanor hate crime or enhanced. Okay, so felonies are still a thing. Felony or misdemeanor hate crime enhancements or involving child abuse, domestic violence. Okay, so there's still verbiage in there specific to that. Okay, I was just curious because the thing is, like, I'm just, I, I was, I always try to go to the worst case scenario of things to see what might unfold. And regardless of the physical, like, we, we don't have to go to internal affairs anymore, which is great. Aside from that, they're still going to have very specific protections about the information they deliver and to who gets it, right? If they're a sworn commissioner, they should be able to get it, I think. But they're still going to have objections to certain things. That's all. I was just curious because, but this this clarifies that this more uh, uh, broad description here. Um, could you just go back to the other one we were looking at, though, real quick? Well, I, I think, think I it, just, just to chime in, though, what I think, what I believe everyone, and I want to say everyone, I think current commissioners and also I think the community wants is they don't want the department deciding who does or does not provide oversight for them. So I think that's why we don't want the police department providing those background checks to say, you know what, Brandon got a speeding ticket and we don't feel he could be impartial. So therefore we don't want him on the commission. That's what we're trying to avoid. Um, so sure. I, I think that that's kind of why that verbiage is in there. Yeah. And I absolutely completely agree with that. Um, Records should be, oh yeah. So, so I'm just curious, not, I think it's good. I'm just curious. What is the, uh, uh, all departments. Is that in case something is located somewhere else and they yes. say it's out of their purview? Okay, got it. Yeah, all because right. the current draft only requires the police department to share records. It, so we're just saying that needs to be all city departments in case there's yeah. evidence in another department. Yeah. Yeah. All right, cool. All right. Um, Andrea, I see you have your hand up with some questions. Mm, yes. Um, hi, everyone. And uh, Good afternoon. Thank you, Brandon. I am working with individuals who were sentenced for felonies. They did prison time, came back to their communities and have done wonderful work since then. And some of them have gone on to receive so-called certificates of rehabilitation. A certificate of rehabilitation is a highly regarded document that testifies to the circumstance that the individual has done 
everything humanly possible to rehabilitate themselves. And it's a process that actually, I think it goes through the state. So it's an, it's an authority that oversees that process and approves it. Is that a possibility to um, consider either, um, you know, whether in writing or otherwise? Um, because I do agree with Patrick in the sense that, you know, people can have felonies for all kinds of things. I mean, you would be surprised sometimes what crimes are actually classified as felonies. Um, and in our, in my line of work, as long as a person has a felony that is a non-sexual, non-violent um, felony, non-serious, those are the three categories, um, it, you know, we still work with them. So the current language of the draft would not, there's no, protect, there's no, um, a certificate of rehabilitation wouldn't, wouldn't, undisqualify them. That's precisely why we're offering this change, because there are all kinds of stories of people who have felonies and, and those various misdemeanors for all kinds of reasons who we believe shouldn't be automatically disqualified. Okay. And so that's why we're offering this change. Okay. One of the things that I, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was just wondering if so if somebody does apply and let's say they do have a felony in their record, you know, could it be something to be considered like say they yes. were able to yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah. This mm -hmm. doesn't this doesn't bar anybody from considering the specifics of a conviction or the any other, you know, the specifics of a history. It doesn't bar considering those in the selection. All it does is stop the city council from automatically disqualifying people. Yeah. Okay. And one of the things that I had had proposed, you know, that we could potentially talk about um, was in the transition committee meeting is, you know, maybe we kind of change this a little bit so it's not in the implementation ordinance. And then we have that as part of our standard operating procedures that the city council would then still have to approve that would then kind of work out, you know, what is or is not a disqualifying, you know, criminal past criminal activity, you know. Um, we we I, can do that, except that not all the nominees will necessarily come from the commission. True. And so but it, in order, but, but yeah, I, still, I think for now yeah. though, we should just focus on the implementation ordinance. I think they're all, I mean, the standard operating procedures are gonna be a whole other, a whole other round. <laughs> Um, yeah, my, my thought for that is just it's easier to change a standard operating procedure than it is an implementation ordinance. Now, that was kind of why I was thinking it might make it easier to do that. But I mean, it's we're trying to be as inclusive as we can. And like the excuse, not excuse, the example I always put out there is if someone received a DUI five or 10 years ago, like in my personal opinion, I don't think that should disqualify them. Um, you know, if someone had, you know, a more serious, you know, a murder felony or something like that maybe that's a different story but you know i think that we want to try to make sure that people that have interfaces with the police department have the opportunity to potentially serve on the commission but i, I think i'm preaching to the choir on that one so i'll stop <laughs> do you have any other questions or anyone have wants clarification and nancy i saw you previously had your hand up but now it's down did we answer your question I, I think you did, yes. Okay, I don't, there we go, uh, Poppy. Yeah, I don't, I don't have any questions and just um, thank everybody for their hard work. All of these changes seem really germane and appropriate. Um, the only recommendation that I have regarding um, how these items are written that I think would, make them easier to um, to receive is the, the potential to add, you know, a two word topical ahead of the paragraph. So in, in for example, in item one, geographic geographical restrictions colon, and then the rigid geographical restrictions. Um, Number two would be operating procedure. Three would be criminal convictions. I think that 
will make all of this easier to um, to to take in and potentially ensure that what I heard you say earlier was, you know, there were recommendations that were made that were either, you know, maybe overlooked or not responded to or whatever. And, and that way, um, you know, it's a little bit more clear and easier to track if, if a recommendation was indeed um, integrated or made for what that's worth. Okay, thanks. I agree. <laughs> I think it'll make it easier and try to make it a little um, more simple to read. Um, I don't see any other hands up. So I guess. I'll make the motion, Brandon. Please let me okay. make the motion. Go ahead. I move, I move that the commission endorse these recommendations. Do we have a second? A second. second. I think that was Poppy. Is that right? Maybe. Poppy, was that your voice I heard say second? It was. Okay. Yep. It was. All right. So we have a motion by Patrick, a second by Poppy. Um, and Nancy, I see you have your hand up. You're on mute. For discussion, are you there yet? Um, we have a, a motion on the table, but yeah, let's go into discussion. Okay. Um, I think your number one item is absolutely the most important. It is for me. Um, and I think number two should be the original um, document access that's in number four. I, I, for me, that's a really critical item. So that would be the only thing. Otherwise, um, the one that I think should be here that is at the bottom is Doug's addition at the bottom that I think also should be elevated to um, a recommendation. The Thank note. You. Yes, right. There's a bit of history on this one too. So that is, and we have already made that recommendation. It was one of the not uh, one of the seventeen that we did months right. ago, um, and so the the way that we've sort of thought about how to come back to it now that they didn't incorporate it. And this isn't just us thinking, like this was also something that the that the, the engaged community folks thought would be a good strategy is that we put that into the standard operating procedures. So we remind them, so we decided to remind them on this document of that previous recommendation, but this is something that we can we can write into the standard operating procedures about um, the commission's involvement with the selection and appointment. There's been so much back and forth about the city council's authority to appoint and different readings of what all that includes or what space it leaves for delegation of certain parts of the appointment process. Um, and so it's, uh, it's a tangled web. And I agree with you, I think it's crucial. Um, and I, I think putting it in at this point, putting it into the standard operating procedures um, is going to get us is going to get us as close as we are, are going to be able to get to what we want. Well, okay. and I'm disagree that I think what will get us what we want is putting it in the municipal code, but in the other section. In what other section? The uh, oh right, I see that you added that part. Yeah, I mean, and and so we we can go and ask the, the PSNL in uh, and we can come up with language and get somebody from the PSNL in to, uh, to introduce that. Okay, as long as it's covered somehow, thank you. Right, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I didn't include it as one of the nine because the, the nine uh, refer specifically to the implementation ordinance. And we were saying, okay, we accept the fact that maybe we, it shouldn't be in the implementation ordinance. It should be in another um, Unicode ordinance, uh, but we didn't want to give the impression that we were giving up on it. And so that's why I added it to the end. And I'm okay if everybody else is uh, in changing the priority switching, uh, was it two and four, if you go back up, yes. yeah. Brandon. Uh, you know, unless somebody on the uh, committee. I 
I, I, I agree with that. I'm fine with that. I mean, I think all nine of these are important, but I agree with Nancy that if we are looking at them as ranked, that the investigations definition is absolutely crucial. Thank you. And I also think it'll be important in the uh, cover memo, uh, Brandon, to recognize the fact that many of our 17 uh, recommendations were incorporated, some of them almost word for word, some of them partially. Um, but I think it'll be, I think it's important to recognize that, uh, our previous letter was obviously read, given, Actually, yeah, read, upon. <laughs> read it and acted upon, um, and that we appreciate that this is a much better ordinance, uh, or much better draft than a draft one, uh, but we still have uh, some significant concerns. Nancy, did you have any other comments? No, I just would move four up to be number two. That's all. Got Thank it. you very much. Yep. Uh, Robin. And I, I, I know everyone's ready to move on. So I, it's not, a, I don't, it's not a belabor, a point that I would like to belabor. I'm wondering what the power is in ranking them. I mean, my personal take is we're going to be putting all nine of these in that memo. Um, right. And so I think the idea is obviously is if we as a commission are approving and, you know, as as Patrick said, you know, we're essentially ratifying these these nine points. I mean, they're all important. Um, but I mean, I think just in the memo itself, we can just put them in, you know, a high level order. Now, that being said, they're not going to say we're going to take the top three or, you know, whatever. They'll look at them and decide whether or not they feel it's appropriate and do what they want to do. But um I, think I just wonder, really and I guess I'm, yeah, I just wonder if it doesn't sort of, um, I have no idea if, if there's, if there's research behind this. So as I'm reading it, I'm just thinking, okay, so you tell me that you have these top nine priority items. We're going to compromise with you and do exactly that. We're going to take the top three. The, yeah. The problem is, I mean, that first one really is crucial. Yes. The problem, the problem is that it's such a complicated puzzle that like, four and five and six are intricately related. And so if they start to accept one of those, they're likely to be able to fold in the others, but they also depend upon one of the ones later on in a particular way. So I, I actually don't wanna rank them. I'm okay with one being, you know, the really sort of flashy first one um, and moving investigations up. But in my opinion, like, we've, rather than being a ranked list, this is like, we've diluted this down to the, to like the base molecules of what's most important at this point. Right. You know, and we need, we, we need their attention to all nine of them. Yeah. And so that's what I'm just wondering if we want to say they're in priority order or just there's, I think having numbers is helpful just in terms of reading it, but I, I wonder, I don't know. I just worry about saying this is, this is our priority order. And so uh, I, I don't have how, a, you know, yeah, I don't, I don't have a strong feeling about putting them in priority order. Um, why well, I, I think I, it's, I, 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 I think that's good. I think it's good for us to put them in priority order, but maybe it's not critical that we put in the document that they're listed in priority order. That makes yeah, sense. Yeah, we should, we should remove that. that. We, we should remove yeah. that from the top. That's so that's just, that was my recommendation is you just take that out. Cause it makes, again, from like sort of that negotiation standpoint. Yeah. I think, yeah. Yeah, you should. I agree with it, you, Robin. It does say yeah. that at the top, and we should take that out. Maybe, maybe it should say something like the following are equal priorities for the commission. Well, I'm not sure they are equal because no, it's not true. Yeah, and so I mean, I think it, it probably is in priority order, but uh, saying but that isn't uh, this whole document relevant? Isn't everything in here? Yes, something yes. That, Yes. Yeah, so the whole thing should be considered as a big priority yeah. altogether. They're not negotiable or this can wait till later. They yeah. all need to happen. Just take well, out in priority order at the top and we're and that's it. I don't yeah, think we, we, yeah. And I was gonna say, and I think that's why when, when, I, when I draft that memo, I, I'm not gonna say, you know, this is our number one item. I mean, I think as everyone has just said, all of these taken as a whole are what we as a commission feel are appropriate changes to the draft. Um, and, and I think, you know, that that's where we leave it is, is we've done our outreach. We've worked with the community. We've had our transition community meetings. We've now had a special meeting of the commission. And we have decided that these are the important items that need to be incorporated in the draft amendment changes. 
So with that, um, I'll go back to the motion we had on the table, unless anyone else wants to have any comment on it. Okay, we had a, a motion um, by Patrick and a second by Poppy. And then we are taking out the in priority order out of that when I dropped the memo. Um, and do we still want to change uh, two and four so that they are kind of in priority order? Just move to move four up, make it number two, and shift the others down. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's what I meant. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Please. If they only read the first three, I want them to get at least those two read. That's all. To Robin's well, point that they might not read the whole thing. You know, and, and to be honest, I'll say when we sent memos, especially on something like this uh, to city council, I, I, and just conversations that we've all had with them, I, I got the impression that they are reading and they do care and they are paying attention. It's not like <laughs> they're handing it off to another staff or to just kind of push it through the system. Um, so I think especially when we write something like this to the city council, especially public safety, global neighborhoods, um, I think they're all pretty, pretty aware and, and follow up on it. Um, so with that, uh, Sherman, can you do a vote on the approval of these nine items for our memo? For our commissioner case? Uh, let me think about it. Uh, I'll vote yes. <laughs> Commissioner Vaughn? Yes. Commissioner Fitch? Yeah. Commissioner Holtrop? Commissioner Holtrop? She was on, but other oh, she is. Sheila, you there? I see, she, I see that she's not on mute, but maybe let's come back to her. Okay. Or, or, or maybe ask her to reply in the chat if she's able to. That works too. Commissioner Anderson. Yes. Commissioner Dent. Yes. Commissioner Spruce. Yes. Commissioner Harrington. Yes. Okay, so I see Commissioner Holtrop's response is a yes. Okay, and Ernestine is here. I, yes. I didn't get to her yet. I didn't get I'm to sorry. her yet. Commissioner Dabba Griffin. Commissioner yeah. Dabba Griffin. Yes, sorry. Thank you. Commissioner Smith. Yes. Commissioner Clark. Yes. Chair Hilpert. Uh, okay. Usually I abstain, but I'm going to vote yes. Motion passes. Unanimously. 12 to zero. No thank exceptions. You. If I could just say thank you, everybody. This has been um, uh, uh, this has been a lot of really intense work. And the last week in particular with the the way in which the second draft was dropped and the time, the small window we were given to get this together. It really has felt like everybody on this commission and on the transition committee and all of the community partners and so on really came together to put this list together and justify it. Um, and it feels so good now to take it back to the round table in an hour um, and report to everybody that this commission unanimously, without any abstentions, um, stands behind this work. I mean, this is really work that we all did together. And I think the community, the, the member, the parts of our, of San Diego that have been engaged with the CRB and the CPP for so long, you know, over the last year, you can feel the energy change. You can feel that there is, um, there's been this movement for, for support for this body on the part of people who have long been critical of, of the work, um, you know, of the CRB. And I'm not saying there isn't still criticism. There is, there's a lot of it, but because of this last now little more than a year, um, I, I mean, I hear all the time that people are proud of the work that this commission is doing and they understand the workload and how exhausting it is 
and how our workload has gone up. And those of us who are still on this commission are really devoted um, and are hanging on. You know, there's just, there's a different energy. So anyway, sorry to go into a sermon, but to be able to go back and report back to them, I'm getting a little emotional. Um, unanimous support um, is, is, it feels great and it's gonna, uh, it's really gonna resonate with them. So thank you, everybody. If I could ask a couple of questions. One is, uh, Brandon and Charmaine, will you be able to uh, get the memo and the uh, uh, recommendations to the members of PSNLN and their uh, chiefs of staff by like eight o'clock in the morning <laughs> tomorrow? I'm, or, I'm hoping so. I'm, I'm actually gonna be working on drafting that memo this evening, so. Okay. Uh, and then what I'll do is, as I usually do, I'll, I'll share it with the rest of the cabinet and then we'll make any edits or changes. And then um, I'll ask Charmaine to forward that out. And as I think we mentioned earlier, we're gonna send it to all the members of the city council as well as their chief of staffs, chiefs of staff. Um, and then plus our, our usual you know, CC list as well. And of course it'll go to all the commissioners as well. So once that goes out, you'll all get a copy of that. And Patrick, I saw you just raise your hand. Did you have a question? I was gonna ask you to send it to me so I could post it and send it to that huge list. Yeah. We have yeah. a time frame that we're aiming for. Um, I was going to try to also attend that meeting at six o'clock. Um, so I'm going to try to get it done as soon as I can after after that meeting. Um, so I don't know. I probably might will get it by eight thirty nine o'clock tonight, maybe. I'll, I'll text you guys to let you know <laughs> where we are on it so we can look at it. I'll get it done as fast as I can, I promise. <laughs> Okay, then my, and then my I just put it. I just put a note. I'm sorry, Doug, forgive me for go ahead um, interrupting. But Brandon, I'll be online really late tonight. So if you want a second set of eyes to edit after you're done, I'm happy to do that. Just send me a text. Okay, will do. Thank you. Appreciate it. And then I, my second question is I'm wondering how many people are actually going to attend and speak at the uh, PSNL admitting tomorrow at two. How many commissioners? Mm -hmm. I was planning on being there, um, so I'm not I, sure. And Doug, I assume you probably will be as well. <laughs> I will be. Um, I, I can't be there because of work, um, but I also don't think we should have it. The three of us should be the three spokespeople for the Commission on Police Practices. I think other folks should, should go. Um, but yeah, I can't be there because of work obligations. Okay, is there anybody else besides me and Brandon who is able and willing to to go? I think the two of you are perfect. Not that other people shouldn't go, but I have been there before and I'm in a grumpy mood. I don't think I'd be helpful. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, part of the reason I'm asking too is we're only gonna have a minute each. And so we want to... Uh, um, you know, in the minute, we can highlight our recommendations, uh, but I was thinking if, you know, we have more than two, we might be able to go into a little bit more detail. I was hoping you would be there, Patrick, but I understand. No, I can't, but I can tell you that there are so many community members who are going to be there. I've And when I sent out this list of endorsements earlier, I've already gotten a ton of emails back from people who are so excited that this is what we were presenting to the full commission. So, I, you know, what I was saying earlier about it feeling like we really are collaborators with so many of, of, of these communities in San Diego, I think we're going to be speaking with one voice with them, and they're going to be taking our recommendations in there and endorsing them. So I love that the two of you will be the one speaking, and I love that you're going to be, um, you're going to be supported by other people, um, you know, carrying the same recommendations in. So can we still donate our time? I mean, we used to be able to sign up and I never did it, but you can sign up and then. No, you can't do that in the virtual. Yeah. So unfortunately in the virtual uh, system, uh, you can't cede your time to somebody else like you can when in person. And uh, they also don't allow for uh, organized presentations. So normally when you're in person, you can say the three of us are 
from the same organization and they'll give you yeah. and let you go you know in the order you choose uh, that the order tomorrow will be first come first serve in terms of the person who raises their hand first or dials in first will be the one that uh, is called upon we did also ask if um and i believe charmaine officially put that request in that if we uh the idea was potentially the three of us doug charmaine and myself if we could be panelists so if um public safety local neighborhoods committee members if they have questions that they can actually ask us questions um, but I think the way it's going to work out is we'll be there. And if they choose, they can promote us to a panelist so we can answer those questions. Um, last time, I don't believe they did that. And I know we, um, I tend to speak fast <laughs> and I still ran out of time. So um, that's, I think, why Doug was kind of saying if there's going to be more of us, we can kind of, you know, if we had three people, each of us could potentially take three topics uh, to try to present. But um, we'll find a way to make it work. So maybe Brandon, you and I sometime tomorrow can write out our one minute spill and time it and then get critique, critique it to make sure that they blend well together. Sure. Even though we won't know in, in which order that we'll be called upon. Yeah, that no, sounds good. I, I figure we can kind of try to divide up the piece. I think the biggest ones, uh, item number one, and to be honest, I think that's going to take the longest. Um, as I think we've always talked about is uh, I think we're all concerned that we're not going to have a full commission, which is kind of where we are today. Um, and so I think that's one that, you know, one of us will definitely raise because I want to make sure that everyone on the committee knows that's a big concern. Um, I know Andrea from Standings for Justice, she doesn't feel it's going to be a problem. Um, she said earlier today, or yes, I guess it was the meeting the other day that there's a bunch of people just waiting, like beating down the door to get in. I would love that to be true, but you know, my almost eight years on the board now commission has shown that's not the case. <laughs> so um, I'm still concerned about that one. I want to make sure they're aware. And I think some of the other items, I mean, they're all important, but we can get through some of those others rather quickly because I think they're uh, they're pretty self-explanatory. And I, I think the, the members will, will know what we're referring to. Um, Nancy. Oh, I was gonna say, Brandon, there may be people beating the door down now, but two years from now, um, it, that won't be the case and three years from now it'll be a half full commission and that's what i'm worried about so thank Agreed. you i think we're all uh i mean as we just look at the, how the commission is today i mean we should be 23 members and we're 14. so um so yeah i think that, that, that all of us i think are worried about that and i would assume everyone on the city council is worried about that as well so I, i'm um, not sure well, I hope so, but we'll find out. Well, I just don't think they understand how important it is for this particular group and the work that we have cut out and is allocated and assigned to the commission. I just don't think they quite understand the amount of work and they're asking for volunteers to do it. So that's all. Well, and I, we're getting a little off topic on this and I, I don't want to go too crazy, but one thing that we've always tried to do whenever we've done our recruitment is we try to be very upfront, at least the way that the board and the current commission operate of the time commitment that's required. And it is a right. huge time commitment. As all of us know, you know, as we've had more members yeah. resign, it makes more work for the remaining members that are on there, which then makes it even more difficult for, you know, people who have like commitments, work commitments, you know, et cetera, to be able to dedicate, you know, I think when I was looking at my time last month, I think I put in 80 hours. Um, which we all do a lot of work because we're trying to contribute something back to the community. And that's great. But I think it's also, we have to realize that's not sustainable for most people, um, especially people who have full-time jobs. Um, and I don't think anyone wants, uh, you know, a commission or a board that's a hundred percent, you know, retired volunteers because that's not representative of the community. And that's really what we're trying to do is have something that is more representative of the demographics of the city of San Diego. So anyway, well, let me As I said, we're going slightly off topic. So um, any final comments from anybody? And if not, we have an extra hour before at least Patrick and I and whoever else wants to join. There's that follow up meeting. It's uh, from I think it's six to seven today. Um, and not seeing any, I will go ahead and adjourn the meeting. Thanks everyone for attending. Sorry for having an extra meeting, but this was a really important one so we can make sure public safety, little neighborhoods uh, kind of knows what our perspectives are. And so I think this is gonna be a helpful thing and we appreciate your time today. Thank I, you I all for your work. <laughs>